Okay, well, let's get right to it, shall we? Uh, so our first finalist is, um, all the, is from Alberta, and we're going to talk a lot about some of the great work that she's done. Everyone, Sophia Yang. Oh, this is your walk-on song. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Oh, no. Nope. We'll get there. Can everyone hear me anyway? I have a pretty loud voice. Yeah? Okay. But we are recording, so let's turn... Nope, you don't, we'll pass microphones, it's cool. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to, well, first off, the, big, the first question I want to ask you um, is about how you got involved in the environmental movement. So what kind of, whether it was something you grew up in or if something that you kind of came into in, uh, if there's a story that comes to mind, I want to ask you about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I was 11, I was reading a magazine called Owl Magazine, and that's the one for more preteens. They have one called Chickadee for a younger children, I guess, and one of the articles in there was interviewing Dr. David Suzuki, and at that point, it was still called Global Warming, and I was reading about it, and I was like, wow, I had no idea this phenomenon was occurring, and I was really, really inspired, so I actually wrote a letter to uh, Mayor Dave Broncani um, of Calgary at the time, and I wanted to create a school play that was detailing um, what youth can do to help with the climate change movement, and I got a bunch of my... Uh, classmates in grade seven involved to be different roles of the play and um, it turned out really well so I was really inspired to keep talking about it and um, really bring more awareness to people in my junior high about what global warming was and at that point I remember when I was younger um, what what really inspired me to read this article in the first place was that when I was 11 my grandparents visited from China and they were really in awe of Canada's national parks and Alberta has the, um, has the biggest national park in Canada, Banff, and also has the first one, which is also Banff. Oh, sorry, the biggest is Wood Buffalo National Park, and the first one is Banff. So we took them to every single national park in Alberta that summer. We did crazy road trips everywhere, and I think it was that um, awe of nature and really that, that inspired me to keep fighting for environmental movement and to keep working and protecting national land. And um, in summer 2015, I got to work at the smallest national park in Alberta, which was Elk Island, which was really um, the sanctuary that helped the uh, prairie and wood bison population grow and be able to be refurbished. So I think that was really inspiring, and I hope to continue my journey as an environmentalist. That's awesome. Yeah, I, and the next, that leads me to my next question, which is about how you, how recently you went to Mexico, and you, I think you should tell us about why you went there and what you've maybe what you've learned in that on the trip. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a bit of a story. I talk a lot. Apology in advance. Um, I am currently working in Edmonton for Natural Resources Canada at the Northern Forestry Center, and it deals with it's a federal government that deals with policy, innovation, research, and science. And um, while I was there um, in Alberta, um, oil is a really big topic. Whether it's controversial, whether you agree or disagree, it's everywhere that we go. Um, Canada's currency is really a petrol currency, so it's always being discussed. Um, so because I wanted to learn more, and I wanted to be more than just a critic, I wanted to be a solution solver, I suppose, a solution giver. So I attended the Alberta Student Energy Summit in Calgary, and um, we were at a networking event, and there was a bingo game. And because I talk a lot, I met a lot of people before the bingo game started, and it was that if you were able to talk to as many people and ask them their energy backgrounds and propose a case solution to how you plan to solve the energy crisis, you were able to win a trip to Merida, Mexico for the International Student Energy Summit in 2017. And so because I met all these people, I was like, this is so cool. So I just wrote down all the names before the game even started, and I won a ticket. So from that, um, I traveled to Merida last week, and I actually went to Merida with my good friend Nicole there in February for reading break. We also went to Cancun. And um, it was a really interesting experience because Merida is a colonial city and it's nothing like you would think. There's lots of uh, European influence and um, it's a beautiful architecture, but most of all, the local people there are so friendly and they're really open to having that energy discussion. So while we were in Mexico, what I really found out was that bringing over students from 120 countries talk about the energy crisis, we are nowhere near the finish line. What I realized was that 
um, there were groups of people from different countries talking about their views on bioenergy, biofuels, um, offshore wind, uh, solar, and there were people from different countries, such as those in Indonesia or Zimbabwe, that was saying that before we can reach the point of talking about offshore wind or solar, we don't even have access to biofuel or bioenergy, and we're still using cooking stoves that release up to 20 times more carbon emissions than any other responsible, efficient form of energy. It's important for us to recognize that what may work in North America or the Western world does not work in Africa. And it's frustrating to come to a conference that has international focus, but these issues are ignored. So when I heard that, the room went silent. And I was really inspired by hearing that perspective because it just kind of shut the room down. And I realized that what I thought was my worldview about energy isn't what someone else thinks. I wanted to be, keep having these really fluent and really um, vivid discussions. So I should have also known that going to Mexico, it was gonna be a fiesta as well as a conference. It was amazing. Um, there was an open gala at the end that we involved lots of salsa dancing, Despacito was playing the whole time, and all I gotta say is Viva La Mexico, and I urge all of you to go to the International Student Energy Summit again in 2019. I hear it might be somewhere in Asia this time. It was in Bali in 2015, so it's an amazing learning experience, and people of all ages are welcome to go. I'm looking at you guys. I know you will make great, great contestants, and everyone else, I would really urge you to go as well. Thank you. Awesome. That's great. I have a question for you about what you've learned at that summit, and um, I mean, the, the scope of how, how we talk about energy or climate in general on, a, on an internet, international front is constantly changing. We have, uh, we came up with the Paris Agreement, and even not that long ago, the United States have dropped out. So what do you think, because this is a Canadian talk show, what do you think Canada can do the most on an international front at international summits like that one? So I think with the United States stepping out, um, Canada and Mexico have, have really big shoes to fill because we are two thirds of the rest of North America. And I realized that a lot when we were at the conference that people were, they were not reluctant to speak up, but they were saying, this is reality we're in, this is the climate reality. If Trump decides to pull out, there is nothing, there's, there's things that we can do, but if that's the accord, what we can do the best is to move forward and keep our heads up and keep being positive. And I think that was really great because something that really came up was youth engagement. So as some of you may know, Justin Trudeau is currently the youth minister as well, and he started the Prime Minister Youth Council. And something we talked about was getting youth involved in requires more than just tokenism, it's more than just checking a box, it's more than just for PR, it's more than just to see how we can get more publicity. It's really about, because we are the energy future. And this entire conference we were talking about was how do we empower, well this is Canada specific, how do we empower Canadian youth in different universities, colleges, elementary schools across the country to build up their confidence in being environmental and eco-warriors from the very beginning? So this, so Canada, something we could do is perhaps having more um, environmental focused curriculum, perhaps having more environmental workshops, and really making sure that more initiatives such as free park emission is offered. Because as I said during the conference, for me, what really inspired me was being able to visit those national parks at 11 and seeing what they were. So we drafted several different um, tourism plans and several different types of, I guess, like eco plans as well to see how we can bring children, kids, youth, uh, university tours to more national parks and properties across Canada. And from that uh, scope, we also saw that in Alberta recently, um, Aboriginal history, Indigenous history is more so included in the curriculum. There's more talks about bison, Métis, more talks of things such as pemmican making, or how um, the bison have also helped the people transfer from land to land, and how we're able to resurrect the population. So with that principle in mind, it would be really helpful to get an environmental awareness and scope of that as well in our school curriculums. And when we're talking about this, people from all the other countries are thinking, oh, like we, we're already doing that. Like a lot of our classes are outside. I remember I met um, a really friendly girl from South Africa and she said that because it's so hot, 90% of their courses are outside. And at the end of every class, it was really their mission to, f to reflect on what they learned outside that day and then bring it in on what they learned inside the next day so they could keep that connection back and forth. And I think that's incredibly powerful. Uh, realize that Canada's cold, especially Alberta, so that might not be possible. But I think that youth empowerment and what we discussed at the conference for youth leaders taking the reins and also getting that empowerment out there is especially important. And it was also really inspiring to hear people arguing because there were various views about the efficiency of nuclear. 
uh, we had a speaker there that was discussing the possibilities of nuclear because that is very prominent in Ontario. And then we had lots of good discussions about um, nuclear waste and what that meant as a, as a nation and how we can move forward. So all topics were discussed and Canada has a lot of shoes to fill and we are capable of taking the reins and bring that leadership in. But at the same time, we need to be incredibly aware that we do live in a privileged energy world. Um, I also just want to mention that I'm currently working for MAC, doing contracting work for Natural Resource Canada. I am currently doing contracting work for a company called Canadian Natural Resource Limited. And um, despite Suncor and St. Crude actually uh, dropping oil prices, CNRL has grown exponentially in the last uh, eight years since they opened 2009, and they have operated over 33 million of barrel almost per month. So from that regard, if we continue to live in this oil world, it won't be possible to reduce the emissions and keep on that Paris Climate Accord. And absolutely everyone on the conference agreed with that. And we're looking towards solutions and how we can bring more youth through summits to conferences and open that conversation more. And one last question for you. You're talking about the Prime Minister Youth Council, the youth involvement in, in all this. So you've got a room full of many young, bright minds. What's your advice based on what you've done for the next generation of young folks who are thinking about doing good environmental work? Uh, I would say my advice is don't be scared of failure, and but also be scared of success. Because it's really easy when you um, are successful at something, you get let it get to your head and you get a little bit cocky and you're thinking, oh, I'm so great. This has happened to me a few times. And afterwards I'm thinking, there's so much more I could be doing it's really unhealthy to look at yourself on a pedestal because there's so much more that you could be doing to be helping the world and there's always room for improvement. So be afraid of success in some way that you can always grow. But also uh, don't be afraid of failure in the sense that, um, for example, when I wanted to do my first um, environmental play with my classmates, I wasn't it was like the popular kid in school, so it was very daunting to go up to people and be like, hey, don't be in my play, here's a script, and they kind of look at me funny, but I decided I'd, I would go for it, because at the end of the day, if it was my dream to have that play and to get that awareness out there, it's important to raise that message and to really bring young people forward. And um, what I've realized as I've gone on and on is that perseverance is also incredibly important. I interviewed um, for the Dave Suki Foundation in 2014, and it was my dream position as a public information volunteer, and I thought I had it down pat. But I didn't get the position. And I remember that in 2015, I didn't want to apply again because I was a little bit sad about it. But in 2016, I reapplied. And I really focused on what I think I could do better. And I really um, made it my mission to ask them how they see me fitting in and what things I could be doing to improve as an individual, but also as an environmentalist. And I got the position. And I think perseverance is one of the most important things you can do because it really shows to those around you and also in the environment and the world that you care, that you're willing to keep trying and keep going no matter what. And that is an incredible message to be spreading and it's something that we should all be striving to do every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great.